Hello, we're live. Welcome to Dive Into World Building. Um, and I now have a label, yay. Um, we had some technical difficulties this morning due to obvious software updates that included um, my label coming back. Uh, and for a while, my sound wasn't back, and that was not good. But anyway, here we are. Today, we're talking about city animals. And um, Kate actually uh, is not going to make it today, but she did tell me that the first thought she had when she was thinking about city animals was in days in the far future if archaeologists were to look back at the buildings that we have built uh, and to find animal skeletons there what would they uh, conclude about the nature of our relationships with animals that co-inhabit our uh, cities with us so um, I thought that was an interesting thought, an interesting place to start, because archaeologists, at least in the current mode of archaeology, they tend to have a lot of ideas about how everything must have significance. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, I just uh, maybe they would, you know, maybe they would be like, well, they just had vermin living in their attic or whatever. <laughs> I I wanted I, I wanted to tell of the mysteries this. Yeah. So but anyway, clearly but more these, than just these dwellers, <laughs> no, I mean, but we interred large rodents in our, our, our walls for auspicious purposes. That's right. That's they're right. everywhere and they're required. Yeah. And they're, they're in our transportation services and we have large halls dedicated to, to <laughs> them. And yeah, but, um, but I can this totally. Is assuming that the future is somehow rodent free. Um, I can't have my my <laughs> my utopian dystopia where there's been a mouse plague. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So so anyway. So but I mean so yes. Um, I I thought yeah. it was an interesting question. Now. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that we have tons of animals living in the city and we typically kind of ignore them. Um, some of them, uh, some of them have public presence and some of them kind of don't. Mm. Um, you know, we, we, I mean, pigeons, right? <laughs> okay. You know, pigeons. Jay brought up pigeons. Yeah. Um, pigeons but also have brought up leopards. Presence. Um, Cockroaches are, if we're not sticking to mammals, cockroaches, cockroaches. are, um, public is bad, but they certainly there, and I can't think of anybody I know who would deny they're, that they are a thing. Yeah, yeah, and we're, I mean, there's tons of bugs, there's no, no, there's no question, you know, there's cockroaches, there's bed bugs, I mean, we did have a vermin hangout. <laughs> yes, yeah, But there, there's like, I there's vastly one. more. And as cities have encroached and become a sort of viable ecosystem, mm -hmm. we've seen greater numbers. There, there's actually this great photo set, if you can find it probably easily. It's called like the Fo Foxes of London. Yes. And it's just it's just photos of like people taking pictures of like all the foxes, foxes in people's gardens and on the streets and stuff, just living in London. And I think that's something you don't really think about because everybody thinks, you know, it's the same five sets of animals that live in cities. It's rats, cats, dogs, pigeons, cockroaches. So the end. And yeah, that's no, not, not the end. end. <laughs> yeah. That's, but here's, that's here's vastly the question. not the end. How, what are we calling a city? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, grew up in New Jersey, oh, I lived in Massachusetts and New York. So when I think of city, it's Manhattan, with all the buildings, and the, the high mm -hmm. population density. Yeah. Um, or Boston, where I've lived, which is still a city, high population density, though not as great mm -hmm. as Manhattan. Um, Ithaca is technically a city, but I'm not sure a lot of people would call it a city. Well, I, think um, I, I would say let's start with the high high density um, population. I, yeah, I was going to say let's, with our definition of city, frankly, hmm? as long as we're specifying 
what we're talking about, I think we can be a little loose with our definition of city. Isn't it yeah. more fun to just to talk about the mega cities and just do like Tokyo, Mexico City, London, New York kind of things? No? Well, I mean, yeah. we can. I don't know. I, I think so, because I think um, if, if you wanted to like apply this to science fiction, um, there is the assumption that in science, science fiction has given us like the mega cities, right? Yeah. Um, and that's sort of an entrenched thing of, of this is what, you know, the, an, an urban, a specifically urban population and what animals are coexisting in this urban, specifically <laughs> urban environment. Mm -hmm. Because well, we all know that the suburbs get deer, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, um, I, I house sat in Oakland and there was, um, there was their house and there was like a vacant lot on it, like with a hillside. And then there was an apartment building and there were deer in the vacant lot. And I like jumped a fence to go get pictures of deer, um, <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, at the same time, this is not necessarily so exceptional everybody complains about the deer you get you get moose in alaska and some other places um where there's oh. these urban encounters but people don't think of necessarily like all um, the things that are in other places in, in higher density places i want to i want to see if maybe we can talk about the interface between cities and their borders in a, in a different webcast well, so okay. you know to talk about oh. how we expect cities not to be surrounded but etc but for this um suburbs I, would be a good yeah <clears throat> would be a good topic well also suburbs but like in los angeles the um the city is surrounded immediately by um chaparral and by the mountains and other ecosystems and so are you know places like denver and even Tokyo has the bay right next to it. And so mm -hmm. um, we think about big cities as just being the streets and the yeah. buildings. And so that's a separate, interesting discussion that also talks about the, the animals that come with that. But um, yeah. So, city so animals, where are the right? leopards, Jay? India. OK. Um, interestingly enough, mm. there, there was um, um, there's apparently like a fairly large um, feral pig population in the city, and I forgot which one it was. I'm sorry, I didn't like, um, I didn't record it. Um, and so leopards come in at night to hunt feral pigs, and they had like, you know, the, um, the, 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 the night, night, night vision. Uh, filming and there was like these three people just walking along the street and like off in the darkness is a leopard um, <laughs> searching for feral pigs to kill and eat and drag off oh wow um, that actually sounds kind of cool I mean if you're going to have feral pigs just stay off the streets and let the local leopards do the cleanup it saves on <laughs> ammunition I, well, I know. And... The problem is people don't stay in at night anymore. So, so you do have run-ins with. Yeah. Occasionally, the leopards kill a person. Okay, oh. as a as a former or a, a, as a Southern California native, I'm hearing this talk and I'm sort of having a moment of amusement because, as far as I'm concerned, a leopard is a mountain lion with spots. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And yeah, we mountain have lions. mountain lions who come and eat, you know, backyard animals. Yeah. So, <laughs> what do you mean? This is not well, a I mean, they, they come living. into our areas too, actually. We have coyotes. Yeah. You don't let yeah. your small animals or even your medium-sized animals out at night. But we're not. We're not in a city. Um, I don't know. Although so, city, coyotes do live in cities. Yeah. So. Coyotes do live in cities, and they will probably if the deer. Kind of like the foxes, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We have what I'm. I was just thinking. In the thing about the interfaces for for deer is that they come in um, from the edges. Right. What if you take your your a green space in a city and it's you put it in the interior so that the green space is surrounded by 
buildings and streets and parking garages and things that are not interesting to deer. How long does it take for the deer to find the green space and come walking down the street looking for your, your garden? Or does that already happen? Oh, I don't just, know how long. I, mean, I haven't seen it. Are there, are there deer in Central Park? Um, I, though, I think so. Uh, well, that's also an island. So, I mean, that comes Yeah, that's true. They wonder. I, so, I'm seeing Che saying that, saying falcons. Okay, so I will tell you a story. Mm. My dad worked at UIC for a while. And uh, he had a peregrine falcon that nested outside his office window. Oh, nice. Um, and occasionally he would see it feeding pigeons to its young. <laughs> 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 yeah. And the pigeons were usually alive. Oh. And not happy about this. No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and so we always used to say, okay, so when you have somebody really difficult that you have to work <laughs> work with, you bring them into your office for a meeting while the peregrine falcon is feeding the pigeon to its young. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but I mean, but yeah, so so that was kind of dramatic. And I mean, it was right in the middle of Chicago, right? So... So that Before was I kill you, Mr. Bond, allow me to have you witness a wildlife show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he never actually did it, but <laughs> it would have been pretty it's a little hard to time. Yeah, I know. Yeah, right? hard to time, you, you gotta get you gotta get in that nesting feeding window. Yep. Um, yep. Okay, and so Singapore, you said, has has otters in the city? Yeah, they had a shot of that. They were talking about like the wildlife in, in Singapore and um, they cleaned their rivers and otters came back and they showed these otters along the riverbank and there's like a jogging path and people are just jogging by and there's these otters are like raising babies <laughs> um, on the, on the riverbank, not too far from a jogging path. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, San Francisco, right, is surrounded by, by ocean or by bay, depending on which side of it you're on. Um, and they have, you know, sea lions that kind of hang out on the wharves and stuff. But yeah. I mean, you're, um, you know adjacent to Pier 39, there's an entire sea lion invasion where they had to stop using a whole bunch of the, the, um, the dock space there because it's just entirely overrun by buy them in San Francisco. San Francisco, yeah. Yeah. Definitely sea lions in, in San Francisco. They're big, too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, people are like, oh, that's so street. cute. And then it's like, oh, my God, that's really big. But mm -hmm. I will say raccoons, because Morgan said raccoons. Mm -hmm. um, we, had, we had a sort of a... Um, well, I mean, we're, I'm, I live in the suburbs, okay? I don't live in the very, very hot urban zones, but we had a deck in our backyard, and it was like everybody wanted to live there. <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. so first we had the raccoon family, and then when we had our um, house treated for termites, the raccoon family died. Aww. It was sad, but they were super destructive. <laughs> So we were really excited about having, because you couldn't like leave a soccer ball out in the backyard. They would tear it to shreds, <laughs> right? So, yeah, so they moved, uh, so they so they died. And then the next thing that moved in was a skunk. <laughs> oh, much better. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Less destructive, more smelly. And uh, so because it was living underneath the deck, sometimes it you know, you'd come home on a day that it got mad at something and the entire house would <laughs> And, you know, because it's potent stuff. I mean... Oh, yeah. And, you know, like, I don't mind cohabiting with these animals. I, I really don't, in, in theory. But, like, I do like to keep my soccer ball. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> right? <laughs> and the skunk was so smelly. I mean, I was like, oh, what do we do? Wait. So Wait. We're not having a discussion about city animals. We're having a discussion about humans having an expectation that 
all wildlife has been tamed in that we have domesticated animals and a few vermin, but that's it. Well, I mean, yeah. About I, our expectations. Yeah, uh, yeah. That is definitely part of the topic as far as I'm concerned. Whereas, yeah, I think so. like, we have destroyed all their habitats and then expect them to, to somehow respect these boundaries or respect what little space we have given them mm -hmm. or left to them. Whereas the species are, are they've been here longer. <laughs> yeah, they have. There's, there's, there's just that, that human complete disregard for everything that's not human. Yep. Especially yeah. because it's dumb or it can't well, so, talk or so when we had the skunk living under our deck we had to actually pretend that there were coyotes here <laughs> uh, because because we didn't have actual coyotes which is kind of a you know i mean that would have been complicated but we did have <laughs> yes we had this sand sprinkled about that had been urinated on by coyotes i guess yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, um, but anyway it caused the skunk to move out and the skunk was replaced by possums so, oh, um, and possums are nice. I well, mean, they're, they're possums dumb. are pretty nice. So, so um, yeah. it's worth mentioning possums because not a lot of people talk about them. And in fact, they actually have a, a key role in keeping out uh, ticks. Right. Mm, yeah, they'll no, eat. They'll eat your bugs. And as ticks become more common, did we talk about ticks and ticks? here last week or was that something we talked about over the weekend I well that might have been on the vermin yeah <laughs> yeah no, ticks are, yeah um no ticks i think we talked about um i talked about over the weekend Disease? with someone but oh, okay. um talking about archaeologists then if possums really do have a function i was i was going to say artifacts that archaeologists might find would be mm. whatever you use to keep your garbage cans closed because mm. of raccoons yeah but what if you actually wanted to attract the possums what would we leave behind to say this is what possums did for us this is why we wanted to attract this wild animal that we can't really domesticate like a dog mm -hmm. um, yeah, because some animals just can't be domesticated and we mentioned that before humans right to hang out um, but I mean, humans can be. But the way that they oh. talk about the domestication of cats is that that it sort of co-happened. Like they kind of said, "Hey, we're gonna stick around you," and we got sort of said, "Well, you're eating all the mice and the rats, so that's oh. really cool." The um, mice and the rats that we attract by virtue of our agricultural activities. Yep. Actually, yep. thinking about it, and we and we power their incredible powers of of of. Uh, parturition, I guess, <laughs> baby making <laughs> yeah. by providing them with lots of food. <laughs> right. Um, but anyway, so I mean, cats cats have moved from that into into um, our homes, and I have two of them close by me here today. <laughs> um, I am no feral uh, living too. We have a whole colony of cats, oh, yeah. at least thirteen cats living in the park nearby. Gross. I, I, I suddenly want to write a cat, cat's eye view story talking about the, the great travails of the cats where there was a, a period when the, the humans were trapping the cats and engaging in eugenics and, <laughs> and turning it into a captive breeding project and, and all of these <laughs> sorts of <laughs> All right, I don't think I'm actually going to write that story because I think it's actually <laughs> like three lines long, and I don't really want to be the uh, Richard Adams of cats, but... Oh, come on, Richard, Richard Adams sort of... is cool, so... <laughs> Richard Adams is cool, but, you know, I mean, Juliet, it's entirely your fault that I've actually written a story about, you know, earwax and aliens, so... <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> I'll take the responsibility. <laughs> yeah, it actually happened. I'm going to dedicate the story to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I, I actually was writing down a note about mice and, and rats um, 
being attracted to our debris. Um, See, I want to I want to talk about like you know the fact that people flush their animals down the toilet and they actually are sewer animals that are exotics that don't belong there and are causing havoc. Yeah, and like yep. you know piranhas in in waterways and things. Yeah, people. In, in addition to local fauna. Wow. We we did do an invasive species. Yeah, we did. Thank but we did. We talk about flushing exotic animals. Uh, <laughs> so we're talking. We're, we're talking things like piranhas and um, alligators. Right. Um, but would it really how big? How long can a alligator that is small enough to be disposed of in that fashion survive in the sewers when there are rats and but they can eat the rats <laughs> yeah an yeah. alligator small and enough to battle, go down a, battle. <laughs> an alligator this big and yeah, the rats get this I big. See an alligator that big going to town on a rat <laughs> i mean i guess hey. you know, multiple yeah um yeah i guess because rats don't always... they're all gonna survive right we're just yeah. say that there might it, it only takes a couple to survive before you have a thriving community that's true well, that, you know, that's true splinter he took he took pity on the baby alligator and the next thing you know sorry <laughs> i don't now, like, now think you're gonna write a story about the rat family that adopted an alligator <laughs> yeah well most most of the most of the alligator <laughs> stories are just stories. most of them are apocryphal. Yeah, um, the, yeah because if you get off, urban legend, if you get Australia, more than one, a snake up the toilet is actually real. Oh yeah, yeah. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I snakes. I don't mind snakes. We I, occasionally we have a snake under our deck. Um, yeah, we have snakes. But you know, again, we don't live in a city, so. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have a snake that lives under my garden wall. Yeah. yeah, we've got we've got a local garter snake in our um in our garden in our backyard. It's not really garden. It's more like we have like a backyard habitat. Uh huh. What? So it's, you know what? It's my my great. friend Janice has an endangered turtle that lives in her backyard. She lives. Wow. In, she lives in Florida. Why oh, wow. does Why does New York City not have snakes eating its rats? Well, maybe it does. Does it? I don't think so because I, I think whatever um, <clears throat> it it um, I think it boils down to like there's there's no way to like there's no habitat for snakes to or is do it, that or is it that the rat density is too high because now I'm kind of thinking about urbanization densities of city dwelling animals versus their natural dispersion in nature because you know i don't think you normally have the sort of swarms of of rats in non-urban spaces that you do in urban spaces mm. yeah. Like, yeah, says, no. i up talking they also have more natural predators um <clears throat> in the wild we have much less of a rodent problem much less of a deer problem um probably less of a raccoon problem than people say six miles away in the village do uh -huh. hmm. and certainly uh well except for the deer less than anybody in the city you know um because they've got you know we, we have almost five acres just that's our property and we have two other buildings that they can go into if they get cold um, they're fields. We live out in fields, so they've got plenty of stuff they can eat without coming into our home. Mm. So we're not as attractive as six miles down the road in the village or ten miles down the road in in the city, you know, small city. Um, right. So, so what I want to know is, do cities have a an abbreviated food chain as a result? Is that they kind of do. I think, yeah, they kind of do, I think. Cause, well, um, maybe you could call it a, a simplified food web kind of thing where, right. you, you know, fewer, um, yeah. 
Exactly. Do, do they because actually like have all those less biodiversity? Yeah, but but they do like the um, the falcons in like say New York City are actually doing better than their wild I just relatives read... because there's a like right. there's so much there's nesting space and tons of pigeons to eat. I just read that the population so... density for peregrine falcons is highest in NYC. Mm-hmm. Because wow. of those factors, wow. yeah, I'm sort of not surprised by that. Yeah, because yeah, again, it's like the buildings mimic tall cliffs, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, that they can nest in, and there's a huge pigeon population, <clears throat> and the heat rising from the streets makes the updrafts mm-hmm. that they need to just keep storing over, you know, in search of food. So right. we built falcon habitat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and nobody really knew it for the longest time, and now it's something they're encouraging. Um, I was thinking that that snakes might have a problem in a place with uh, that has that high a population of, um, oh. pre- yeah, of hunting birds, right? Yeah. Um, because they can't live underground with the rats completely. Well, snakes so- also need. They need places to regulate their temperature. They need hibernation places right. in, 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 in places that are cold weather. Um, I think you would probably get a lot more snakes in cities, in places like Florida and South America, yeah. than I'm you wondering. would necessarily anywhere north. I'm wondering um, if I, 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 I the wanna... southwest. I want to mention another animal that's really, really successful in cities, and that is crows. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. The crows in Tokyo, for example, <laughs> are amazing and and kind of scary because yes. they have no fear at all. Um, and they will take your food out of your hand if you are walking down the street with your food. Yeah. Oh, there was the urban monkeys. I was just about to say urban monkeys, and I have an urban monkey story. Oh, yeah. nice. Ah, oh, they're kind um, of dicks. In, yes, in Thailand, there is actually a city known for its monkey population, and um, <clears throat> there are actually places devoted to sort of this kind of thing. But um, when my family was in, in Thailand, we said, oh, look. It's it's just a short train ride away. We'll go do that. And the local ties were like, "Why would you go there?" <laughs> and we discovered why not. Um, we went, and I'm I cannot remember the name of the town right now. Um, but it's uh, if you look it up, it'll say you know, <clears throat> Thai monkey monkey town or something, Thai monkey city. Mm-hmm. But yes, they the all of the the windows in the city area are covered with iron bars so the monkeys cannot get in um wow. there are all sorts of anti-monkey measures everywhere nobody walks in the streets and you know in thailand it's very unusual not to have a street scene yeah mm-hmm. but in this city it is impossible to have a street scene because the monkeys are so predominant oh wow and we went to a temple and there was a monk with a slingshot trying <laughs> to keep the monkeys under control <laughs> and um, I a- made the mistake of walking on the street with a um, the remains of a bubble tea, and the monkey snatched it out of my daughter's huh? hand. Oh, she was yeah. really traumatized. Yeah, and my then partner was walking around with um with just you know a plastic grocery bag, which had a pair of socks that I had just bought that were very colorful. Mm-hmm. They were bright different colors in every part of the sock which I thought was really cool you know the toes and the heels and the uppers and the lowers and the uh-huh. the ribbing and so but the monkey decided that it looked like food and it grabbed the bag ran up with the the package of socks in its teeth up a drain pipe and and just sat there sort of um jeering at me having you know hey hey I got your socks and I just had to look at it and go I hope you get indigestion <laughs> <laughs> Eat your eat my socks. Eat my socks. <laughs> but yeah, um, 
sometimes the, the you know it, it looks all romantic when we see these southeast asian ruins it's like you know oh this used to be a city but now the jungle is encroached and and there are monkeys everywhere and i just sat there in that environment thinking i'm not sure i'm not far away from that and this is not romantic mm. <laughs> monkeys are and my daughter for a year after that would just anytime anybody would say monkeys would just go monkeys are mean <laughs> yeah, monkeys are definitely mean yeah, I, it, yeah. It, it makes me think I need to go back to this novel that I wrote that has a scary monkey scene. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, we expect to be up on the top of the heap. Mm -hmm. It's really disconcerting not to be there. Yeah. And and we expect it. I mean, I I was just, we were talking about San Francisco, and I was just thinking about the fact that, you know, there's an entire area in San Francisco named for sharks. <laughs> Tiburon, tiburon means shark. Yeah. Wow. And, um, you know, we, we expect to be non-dominant in the water. Mm -hmm. We're aware of non-dominance in various places, but yes, in our cities, we expect to be, to be prime. And having to curtail my activities around monkeys was um, a really viscerally memorable experience <laughs> yeah it sounds it sounds like it um and and yeah <laughs> um to to revisit the crows for a second one of the reason why the crows in tokyo are as bad as they are is because um of union rules and this is a little bit a little bit roundabout but basically um because of, of how long it takes for people to get to work on the trains and ah. the trains start in the morning, they can't have garbage pickup before a certain hour. Oh, and I see. People tend to put their garbage out in just the small plastic bags. They don't. They don't have room for like big old honking bins with lids and this, that, and the other, right? So, so people will put their garbage out in bags on the street, and it doesn't get picked up until nine a.m. Well, crows make short work of a little plastic bag. <laughs> basically get a feast with all the garbage that's coming out, right? It's happy hour. It's happy yeah. hour. And so they actually moved, I think they moved the garbage collection back by an hour. Mm. Uh, I think it was from maybe 9 a.m. to 8 a.m. But they can't move it much earlier because, again, of the, the union rules and how long it takes for people to get to work. Yeah. Um, and so it makes it, it makes it really tricky for them to inhibit the crow population from just exploding. They, if, crows if, are um, super smart too. <laughs> it, it seems like if they had like smaller, like smaller plastic lidded bins, maybe. I, it, you know what, I'm not responsible for that. I'm just telling you what I saw. Yeah, no, I know, well, I know. Well, because I feel like it's, it's sort of the same issue with like the, the raccoon locks where Mm. And we're actually like making animals smarter. Like we've actually we've we've built smarter raccoons by forcing them to defeat all these anti-raccoon garbage bins. Um, to to the point where it's almost now where it's like literally like it just a locking padlock is like the only thing that will like defeat the raccoons because they can't work a key. Um, <laughs> Uh, I I gave up on a I, I rented a beautiful condo in in North County San Diego with a ground level patio because I wanted to have a patio garden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And before I managed to organize that, I got visited by the cheekiest raccoon of ever. And this is <laughs> for considering all the raccoons. He just sat there at my screen door, looking at me like, "How come you're on the inside? You're all comfortable. Where's mine? Can I come in?" Yeah. I mean, really. You moved in. You didn't even invite yourself. You, you didn't. You didn't give me an invitation. You didn't say hello. You're so rude. <laughs> and I'm looking at this raccoon, going, "Oh, you just told me I'm not going to have tomatoes on my patio, no matter what it is." I think. Thank you for letting me know by now. Yeah, saving me the trouble, right? <laughs> you you would have thought the coyotes would have kept them down. <laughs> no, not so much. Yeah, we're raccoons. I mean, so. No. We had a raccoon. Um, now, okay, so this is actually not like super city because I was living in Capitola, California, which is, it's a city, but really it's, it's you know, a beachside town kind of 
kind of place, right? And we had yeah. a creek in the backyard. So we had tons of wildlife, okay? And, and so, yeah. you know, anytime you have waterways, you, you're going to end up ha having a lot of wildlife if you're close enough yeah. to, to marshlands or whatever it is. I mean, Newark has a lake that has all kinds of really amazing um, water birds, for example, egrets and herons and all this kind of stuff. Um, but anyway, so we had, we had all sorts of, of things on the creek in Capitola. And ducks and geese and geese are nasty <laughs> and, <laughs> and herons of various varieties and anyway of course we had raccoons but we had a cat door and one night I heard a really weird sound coming from the cat room which was also the laundry room and I went in there and I was all ready to tell off my cat <laughs> because you know um, and there was a raccoon there and what I had been hearing was it was taking the kibbles and washing them in the water bowl and then eating them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And, yeah. and I must have been about 10. <laughs> and I had this standoff <laughs> with this raccoon. <laughs> um, and so I kind of hissed and yelled at it and, and, and ma finally managed to make it feel as though it wasn't welcome. Uh, I didn't scare it. Right. That, that, no. But the raccoon kind of looked at me and was like, okay, fine. <laughs> slowly what? walked out the cat door and I thought, how long has this cat, this, this raccoon been coming into our house? You know? Arrogance so, by name is raccoon. Well, yeah, oh yeah. Raccoon. <laughs> it's it's oh, actually yeah. sort of, um, it's, it's what, what they're, they're, Sydney animals have been evolving to be less nervous in the presence of humans because obviously they can't survive by being nervous. And that's why you get the pigeon who stands, you know, they're looking at you wanting <laughs> what, whatever, you know, it's like, so, so you get all these animals that have and are sort of, I mean, they're still wary. They'll still fly away and stuff, but but they're far less nervous than their wild cousins now. And, As, and things are evolving to live better and more in cities. And we anybody, are evolving these animals in, in, in a way. Has anybody written a uh, post-apocalyptic fiction of the pissed off animals that are um, no longer afraid of humans and really angry that their, their easy food sources have dried up because <laughs> Human civilization has fallen down. No, because I was just. Well, you about, can. <laughs> hmm. I was just thinking about the fact that I, you know, when we were in Australia, emus are really um, they're tall. They're like human sized, and yeah, they're the ones at the Fer Featherdale Wildlife um, Refuge are very acclimated to humans, and they'll just <laughs> so they give you these um. You know, those ice cream cups that, or those ice cream cones that little children like, right? The mm -hmm. the soft ones with the, the cup shape and the... Yeah. And they stuff them full of grass so you can, like, feed the the various marsupials that are grass eaters. But the emus are, have developed a taste for the cones. And they'll dive at your hands. And having something that big just, like, little... It, yeah, it's a big... Jurassic Park so got big. much scarier. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm just imagining that, you know, right now that they're not in suburban Sydney and urban Sydney, there are not emu roaming around, but we already know about the emu war and that it's completely futile to try to send <laughs> massive armament against emus because they can just run around and dodge them like some kind of roadrunner cartoon. And so <laughs> I'm just so thinking about the fact that Post-apocalyptic fiction, for some reason, involves a massive amount of pet petroleum fuel, which I seriously question. Yes. And, and vehicles and people in leather gear and where did all that come from? And no angry animals. Yeah. yeah. I think it's supposed to have more angry animals. Mm. I, if I were a rat, I would be really pissed off. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> uh, you know, the, 
another one, uh, and this is not exactly a city animal, but um, I was thinking of what you were saying about Australia. And uh, you, you know koalas, right? So koalas don't like to live in cities, but, but they like to live in eucalyptus trees. And they are not like squirrels. I should have, you know, squirrels are a thing. They're a city animal. Yep, we've um, got squirrels. There's, there's a different animal in Australia that occupies a squirrel niche. Yes, yes, there are a lot of different animals in Australia. Um, that's why they have things like cat curfews and stuff. But, um, but I was going to say, um, you know, koalas are not like squirrels. They don't jump from tree to tree. No. What they do is they climb a tree, stay there until they're satisfied, and then they come down the tree and they walk to the next tree. So sometimes by chance they will end up going really far into cities just because there's a little trail of eucalyptus trees going into town. And in fact, um, my uh, sister-in-law ended up having a, a koala showed up in her front yard and, you know, in the middle of the city of Geelong um, <laughs> because this poor koala <laughs> had just you know, gone tree to tree and not really thought, <laughs> you know, he wasn't really standing back to look at the larger picture. Just, oh, here's another tree. Uh, and ended up in the middle of town. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I'm not surprised um, that this happens in Geelong, if that's where I think it is. But on the other hand, yes, oh, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so... We've, we're making, it's tree points out, we're making the animals smarter by giving them these, these things that they need to defeat, more complicated things they need to defeat to get to the food. And I'm thinking of octopuses and how mm -hmm. even with the, the coastal cities, mm -hmm. we're not having to share our actual living space with them. Um, food source and you know that that interface but we don't have so far octopuses coming up into our homes mm. and opening things up which I think they would totally do if they could <laughs> well um they could I mean if they could get there if they were in there they would come in yeah. and ruffle rifle through our cabinets and and open our fridges um, and for stuff cause... Eleanor Arneson wrote an octopus story recently oh. yeah she wrote okay. uh, an octopus bookkeeper octopus yes. bookkeeper okay I only remember the story because I, I she started it started with like an offhand joke in her Facebook and she really worked at it <laughs> that's fun oh okay um if it's... they could if they could evolve sort of like mud skippers and take um water with them and um maybe had more bodily structure well i know that could i mean probably, i know that they could get around on land better. you know they don't necessarily stay captive <laughs> No, yes. they don't. No, they, 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 they can they can live a while. No, I don't like them. Oh. They take off and they just take yeah. off and they go back to the ocean. Well, they also they'll they'll walk, kind of crawl, slither from tide pool to tide pool in search yeah. of food. So there's like ah, this tide pool's tapped out. So then they go along, but um, but they can't do it like forever. Right. Um. So you would need you would need some sort of amphibious. <clears throat> terrestrial more terrestrial adaptations sure um than they currently have um well if but, they come into your home yeah i would say yeah that that would that would be like an interesting thing if you lived on the coast and you had to like oh the octopuses you know <laughs> <laughs> darn it <laughs> oh, every night i don't have like i'm running out of lidded jars they can't open ah you know <laughs> um, they would just like come in your windows and ransack your kitchen and so you had to like <laughs> octopus proof everything you know you're like oh i had to octopus proof my house yesterday okay wasn't there, a, go rice now. Now. Wow. Wasn't there an aquarium that had a problem with i was it an octopus that was sneaking out every night yes yeah. yes that yeah. was but that was what the finding dory octopus was based on i think <laughs> yeah right 
I'm sorry, I, I, missed, I missed what Che was just saying about the octopus. I had to take my head. Oh, off. well, no, she was talking about how, you know, it wouldn't take a lot of adaptation for octopuses to be able to, like, ransack your house and oh, yeah. on the yeah. coast to be a major problem. Uh, you know, okay, so, right, yeah. so now I have this, this idea about a, a gremlins and octopuses <laughs> um, mashup. Where you have the mad scientists trying to clone octopuses for whatever reason, and then, and then it goes out of hand, and now you have like an, an octopus army, which because normally they're not that gregarious, right? So you don't end up having like an no, octopus gang. But yeah. now, you know, now I've created the idea of this octopus gang that's ransacking in, in a fury. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, look, we are at the end of our hour, and um, unfortunately, <laughs> I think there are a lot of weird stories going to come out of this one. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I do have a place that I need to go, so um, I'm going to stop the broadcast, but thank you all for being here, and thank you for being patient while I got my sound working. And um, next week, next week, John Chu will be joining us. Um, to talk about his um, short stories and awesome. I have started putting um, Monday posts on the Patreon site um, where I basically they're free to everybody uh, posts where I talk about what we're talking about this week and also, you know, okay, when guests are going to come. And so there's a post up there now mentioning that John Chu is coming on the show and I put links to a couple of his short stories there. Of so if you would like to take a look at his work, you can go and follow those links from the Patreon. Thank uh, you very much. Do you want to yeah. plug your Patreon link special name? Time. Special time for John Chu, who is a, an East Coast working person. So we're going to be meeting at 5 p.m. Pacific on Wednesday the 17th, um, which is going to be uh, a good deal later, and it's going to be, you know, I mean, basically, authors are available when they're available, and so I'm going to uh, schedule ahead and, um, you know, I get lucky. You know, my last string of authors have been very, very, very out, but um, I would rather move okay. out than miss out on being able to talk to somebody like John Chu. So we will see you cool, cool. next week. And, All right. Uh, I will see you then, too. So stop. Yeah. Best. <laughs>